Well, in a disturbing development, Oranga Tamariki has just signalled it's ready to knock on family doors if they refuse to let their children change gender. Now, while OT already has the power for children officially in care, it now says it can intervene in any family, including yours, if it believes parental resistance to transitioning threatens the child's emotional well-being. Let's check it out. So this is a report from the Centrist News Service, one of the many new news services to pop up as trust in the mainstream media plummets. And here's what their report said. Uh, Oranga Tamariki has just signalled it's ready to knock on family doors if they refuse to let their children change gender. While OT already has the power for children officially in care, it says it can intervene in any family if it believes parental resistance to transitioning threatens a child's emotional well-being. A response to an Official Information Act request indicates, not surprisingly, that the government may take steps to protect children if there are concerns about the child's physical safety in the face of parental opposition. However, the far broader brush of protecting emotional well-being, which does not necessarily include physical violence or behavioural indicators to substantiate, is also a possible basis for ministry intervention. Now, the centrist uh, submitted the OIA to the Ministry of Children, seeking to understand whether the children outside the direct care of OT could receive support from the ministry if their family opposed the decision to transition. And OT's response said, while OT says that parental resistance to a young person transitioning would not normally be a concern in and of itself, in the absence of any other risk factors, they said this, there may be times where a situation involving a rangatahi, young person, who is actively considering or is in the process of transitioning, is facing resistance from Fano that may be having an impact on their safety and well-being. So the resistance to protect a child from confusion, chemicalization and castration is a problem to OT. So what constitutes serious harm? OT's response notes that intervention may be based on circumstances in which a child is likely to suffer from serious harm, which includes more than an average disagreement between the child and parent. Those differences could include parents who did not support transitioning expressed in a way which impaired the child's emotional well-being. OT's guidance on so-called serious differences are described in part as likely to be irrecon irreconcilable and result in the child suffering emotional harm due to the breakdown in their relationship with their parent or caregiver. Such differences could include disagreements and arguments about a young person's identity and cultural connection. Gee, there's a whole lot of wiggle room there for an OT social worker who wants to push the gender ideology against the parents. And remember, this is a young person with likely other presenting mental health issues. So let's have a look. You've got, in terms of wiggle room, they say emotional well-being. Not normally be a concern. Actively considering or is in the process of transitioning facing family resistance. Likely to suffer. More than an average disagreement. I mean, what is that? There's plenty of disagreements in families, isn't there? Likely to be irreconcilable. On whose opinion? Is it the parents or the child's? Suffering emotional harm due to the breakdown in their relationship with their parent or caregiver and a young person's identity and cultural connection. Now, the centrist uh, kindly released to me the full OIA documentation and as well as the issues that they have correctly raised, here's a few others. The OIA, the Official Information Act request letter, starts almost immediately with this statement. Gender identity is crucial in the development of a young individual as it is a big part of their personal and social identity. We encourage our kaimai to be guided by rangatahi when determining how best to engage with whānau or family or caregivers regarding their views about the gender identity or sexuality of their tamaiti or rangatahi and the supports they may need to fully accept and affirm their identity. 
You see immediately that there is a wholesale acceptance that gender identity needs to be accepted and affirmed. The child's view of themselves, a child's, is the starting point. And gender fluidity is a given, which of course is a lie. Now, Oranga Tamariki then makes up complete porkies as it talks about the child's so-called rights. It says, the rights of Tamariki and Rangatahi to freedom of expression and fulfilment of personality and identity, including gender identity and sexuality, are set out in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UNCROC, which includes specific provisions for the rights of indigenous children. These rights are also embedded in the principles of the Oranga Tamariki Act 1989 and reflected in the National Care Standards Regulations, uh, which specify that gender identity and sexual orientation are part of identity and cultural needs. Well, here's the problem. Gender identity and sexuality are mentioned nowhere in UNCROC. OT have made that up. Do a word search on gender or sexuality in UNCROC. Zilch. This is the paragraph on identity. And it says, Identity. Children have the right to their own identity, an official record of who they are, which includes their name, nationality, and family relations. No one should take this away from them. But if this happens, governments must help quickly children to quickly get their identity back. Yep, name, nationality, and their family. Biology. Now, section 29 of UNCROC also talks about identity, but as it relates to the cultural identity of the child's parents. So there's nothing about uh, sexuality or gender identity. But then they refer to the Oranga Tamariki Act uh, 1989, section 5, and let's have a look. It says, principles to be applied, the well-being of a child or young person must be at the centre of decision-making that affects that child or young person, including those rights set out in UNCROC, which we've just shown you, and the child or young person must be protected from harm. Ah, okay, so according to the recent CAS report and the leaks from WPATH and the latest research out of Finland and Sweden and Netherlands, etc., etc., we should definitely protect a child from going down the harmful road of trying to change their sex. Trying. We should heal the mind not cut the body. Uh, but then further down, you'll see that a holistic approach must be taken, including whakapapa, cultural identity, gender identity, and sexual identity. Now, here's the interesting thing. These changes came about as a result of the Children, Young Persons and Their Families, Oranga Tamariki Legislation Act 2017, and then also, as I said, the National Care Standards uh, Regulations 2018 is referred to. Cultural safety, uh, let me just show you this. Cultural safety refers to gender or sexual orientation or gender identity. Or interestingly, religious or spiritual belief. Oh, except, of course, that belief that you are born male or female or that you can't change sex or that marriage is a man and a woman or that certain forms of sexuality, or that pornography, or that sex outside of marriage are considered sin, then you're definitely not in the circle of cultural safety. Now, I was, I was interested in this uh, difference between gender or gender identity. So I went to the practice centre of Oranga Tamariki, and it's very helpful for me to learn wokeness and just how far down the deep dark hole our so-called child welfare agency has gone. And it has this whole section, and it talks about gender refers to uh, the attitudes, feelings, and behaviors that a given culture associates with a person based on their sex, male or female binary, assigned at birth. Gender identity is the gender someone identifies with most, a sense of being a man, woman, fafafene, genderqueer, trans, non-binary, gender fluid, or something else. Uh, and then there's an explanation of uh, sexual orientation and LGBTTIQ. I thought it was LGBTQIA+, and where did all the T's come from? 
It's transgendered, transsexual, and two-spirited. Uh, two-spirit refers to a person who identifies as having both a masculine and a feminine spirit, and is used by some indigenous people to describe their sexual gender and or spiritual identity. Uh, and then further down, how to affirm. So you'll see there, it uh, refers to Rainbow Youth. Yep, send them on to Rainbow Youth. And then to the guidelines uh, in that second circle there, which of course takes you through to none other than WPATH, the Radical International Group, which has been totally discredited, and PATHA, the Waikato Trans Unit, which is a radical group of activists that we've discussed previously with their deeply flawed guidelines, which the Ministry of Health must relegate to the rubbish bin. But here's what the OIA from Aranga Tamariki says. It is important that the caregiver's beliefs and views about gender identity and sexual orientation are explored in the caregiver assessment process rather than waiting until after they have begun to care for a child or young person who may be gender diverse. So this is for caregivers. Tamariki and Rangatahi have the right to access support from Rainbow Youth or other agencies which support gender identity and sexuality. Uh, support plans also can also include ensuring caregivers are linked to appropriate support organisations such as Rainbow Youth or Inside Out. So you'll notice it's not pastoral counselling or counselling from a Christian youth worker who is walking with a family. Nope, it's the holy grail of Rainbow Youth or inside out. In other words, conversion therapy in the direction that the state sanctions. Conversion therapy is still legal in New Zealand as long as you do it the way the state wants it. And the parents or caregivers can get some support from inside out. You know, a session of RSE, Relationships and Sexuality Education, and a test on how many sexualities and gender identities there are and what the caregivers preferred pronouns are. Now, if concerns were raised regarding a caregiver not supporting rangatahi with their health needs, it says, or that they were responding in ways that were not supportive of the child or young person's gender identity needs being met, this could be considered through such a review process. Our priority is to ensure the safety and oranga, uh, holistic well-being of tita Aimiti, tamaiti or rangatahi through the course of their care journey where it is assessed that despite appropriate support and training a caregiver is not able or willing to support the rights of a tamaiti or a rangatahi to express their identity alternative placement options would be explored in partnership with the children and their whanau or family the caregivers and others involved with them gee it's pretty clear that OT will push a gender fluidity message. And if children don't get their way and kick up a stink, OT and Rainbow Youth and Inside Out will be there to practice conversion therapy on the child and help them over the line to chemicalization, castration and confusion. OT really needs to read the CAS report and watch a few McBlogs where we've highlighted all the research exposing this flawed ideology. The state agency, which is supposed to act in the best interests of vulnerable children, is focused on making them more vulnerable by dragging them into gender confusion and add to that trauma by separating them from their family and whānau, who in most cases will have the very best interests of the child at heart. The state makes terrible parents compared to loving mums and dads who just want to protect their children from flawed gender ideology. Mm -hmm.